Welcome back to another Real with Ryan podcast episode. In today's episode, we are interviewing my good friend Hudson Shreve. Hudson is a serial entrepreneur who has started multiple businesses and is also a rock climber, adventurer, a great storyteller, and just an awesome person. In today's interview, as you'll listen, we talk about facing mooses in Alaska and bear hunts. We'll talk about rock climbing despite a fear of heights. We'll talk about facing fear, starting multiple businesses. We'll talk about water climbing waterfalls, Christian motorcycle gangs, as well as some other just life lessons that Hudson has learned along the way. But without further ado, I hope you enjoy this episode, and I know it will be just as fun to listen to as it was fun to have the conversation. Okay, and we are live. Well, Hudson, my friend, welcome to the show. Howdy, howdy. Perfect. Well, I, I figure we can just jump right into some fun stuff. Um, as you heard from the intro, uh, Hudson is a man of, of many talents and experiences, and today's conversation is likely going to be a blast. Um, and we'll definitely talk about a lot of things, including entrepreneurship. But before we do, Hudson, um, as a longtime friend, I've heard some experiences about uh, was it either lions or bears or tigers? And Hudson, <laughs> I wanted to to kind of turn the table over to you to to talk through one of those experiences, whether that's about a bear or a mountain lion or ex- anything that comes to mind, and and give people a, an idea and some color of some of the stuff you're into. Heck yeah, man! Well. As your listeners might know, we are longtime friends, uh, many adventures in our work time offices, and uh, I want to coin a nickname for Ryan that many people may not know, but is uh, I feel appropriate in this new uh, diet that you're on, Burley Brooks, all right? Everybody listening, Burley Brooks, that's, uh, Burley Brooks. that's, that's Ryan, okay? He's a swole dude, and he's going to get bigger <laughs> with this new diet of his. Um, yeah, um, bears, tigers, or mountain lions, man. So I've never had any experience with tigers, but, uh, me and Daniel Funk, we, we had a mountain lion excursion not too long ago where we saw one out in the woods, or at least that's what I would say. He he might call it a log, but that's, uh, (laughs) that story might be for another time. I might let him start that, (laughs) that story, but, um, I'll tell a story about some bears, man. Yeah. So, uh, I am related to a longtime bear hunter. He owns a magazine called Bear Hunting Magazine, and he's on Meat Eater quite a bit. He's actually on Joe Rogan here recently, but his name's Clay Newcomb. Mm-hmm. He's my uncle, and uh, he's a great, great man. He actually officiated our my my wedding two months ago with my lovely wife. And uh, but him and I a few years ago, he was looking for someone to film an Alaskan bear hunt that he was going on in this little island off the coast of Alaska called Squitna. And uh, he reached out to me knowing that I did a lot of photography. And I think it was just really an opportunity for him and I to bond a little bit. And um, it was, it was incredible, man. We, so we flew out from Fayetteville to Anchorage and then from Anchorage, we took a bush plane all the way down to this island. And I remember I was sitting in the back of this bush plane and he was up front with the pilot and man, the amount of turns we were doing, I didn't realize I hated airplanes until I was in this bush plane because we were in the most beautiful country in the world. But all I could think about as I was filming him was the amount of vomit that was spewing out of my mouth in a paper bag uh, because I was just uh, like just the worst motion sickness ever. But we got some good film out of that bush plane flight. We landed on a river in Squitna and we set up camp for about a week and a half to two weeks. And uh, I I wish I could remember the outfitter that took us, but it was a really, really good outfitter that uh, took us to this part of Squitna where all of the salmon of like, I'm not sure if it's North America, but uh, that's the salmon run. It's where the Mm -hmm. salmon move up river to go to their breeding grounds and their breeding grounds. One of them was in Squitna, Alaska. And so you'd see all these salmon swimming up river and they stopped here in Squintna. And so the rivers usually were brown, but in this time of year, they were red with the amount of salmon that were clogging those rivers. And I'm not kidding, man. You could reach your hand into that river, and within five minutes, you could probably catch one. 
they were they were old salmon. They were tired, but they were still good. And so we caught mm-hmm. primarily salmon for dinner and whatnot. Uh, fly fishing. It was it was the best fly fishing I've ever done because there are salmon inches apart from each other. But we started the hunt moose hunting. So we moose hunted for about four or five days there. And the Alaskan tundra, it is the last frontier for a good reason. The Alaskan tundra, man, it takes you five minutes to walk five feet just because of how thick it is in there. Mm -hmm. And so Clay, he was hunting and I was filming and he would call for a moose. And the way you call for moose, there's a couple ways. You can either, uh, there's an actual moose call with your voice, but there's also, if you grab a stick or something and you just rattle it against oh, yeah. other trees and whatnot, that's the sound of like uh, a, a grown bull moose hitting uh, its antlers against mm-hmm. trees and whatnot. And it's kind of like a, either an intimidation factor or letting other bull mooses know, hey, I'm breeding, come over here and take my girl or just mess with me, you know? Wow. And so when we did that, man, we heard a moose. We heard a moose probably 30 yards away. Mm-hmm. And it was coming closer and closer and closer until we literally saw its antlers. And I remember it hitting against the trees, maybe, I don't know, 30 feet ahead of us, but we couldn't see it because of how mm-hmm. thick the tundra was. But it was getting closer and closer. And it didn't come close enough. But if it came close enough to where we could have killed it where we were, it probably would have killed us because of how close it would have had to be in order for us to shoot that thing. And then closer to the end of the our time, we started grizzly bear hunting. And uh, we went to these different spots. And uh, there's this one spot we'd stay at for a few hours every day. And it was usually right before the right before it got dark. And we would stay there until darkness. And we stayed there three or four days, didn't see anything. Then on the final day, a grizzly bear finally showed up. And to paint a picture for you, we were the hunters. Our guide was the guide, and he knew this area a lot better than us. We decided, you know what, let's put some bear like spray on us so they don't smell us. And uh, let's hide behind this bush right here and just wait for them to come. And as we're hiding behind this bush, we're about 20 feet away from where the grizzly bear was supposed to show up from the tundra. And our guide, he was way up in a tree. He knew better. He knew you shouldn't be in behind a bush while this giant grizzly bear is coming near. But I think we had some conf- like may- maybe a bit of overconfidence in in ourselves um, just because of, I, I don't know. I-, 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 I wish I could explain why we were behind a bush, but I don't know. But eventually the grizzly bear came up and we had this giant bait site. It was filled with popcorn and things like that for it to eat and old salmon. It was not interested in that old salmon. Rather than looking at the old salmon that was right in front of it, it was looking at us about 20 feet away. And it, oh it saw God. us from behind the bush. And it started doing this thing they call a bark. And it's where they snort out of their nose. And it sounds like a bark. And it was pounding his paws against the ground, like angry that we were right there. Dude, the term shake in your boots is real. I was shaking in my boots looking at that thing and I was filming it. And eventually uh, Clay was able to get a shot and he shot the thing and uh, it was beautiful. And I remember we waited for about 30 minutes and mm-hmm. then we went into the tundra to go and try to find it. Cause it ran a little bit after we shot it yeah. and it's about twilight. So we can't see very well. And we either very much angered that bear or we, or it's, or it's dead. One of the two, if we angered that bear, we're dead, <laughs> you know, cause we're more in the tundra. It's very thick and you can't really see until, un- unless you're uh, like, until you're about, you can only see about five feet in front of you. And I remember the guide was in the very front. Clay was behind the guide and we all had, they all had giant rifles and I was behind clay and I had a little tiny pistol and a camera. So if that bear charged and it got through clay and the guide, all I had was a pistol. I'd probably be dead too. Mm. But lucky about 20 feet in, we found the bear. Man, it was the most beautiful thing. It was beautiful. And it was a, a mature bear. So it, it had a done its breeding. It, has lived, it had lived a good life. And so it had given Mother Nature. And uh, it was its time. You know what I mean? And yeah. I think that's what I appreciate about um, hunters' tags and licenses and things like that is they're never for immature bears or immature animals or anything like that. They're for animals mm-hmm. who have already given and, uh, and, uh, 
Yeah, so it, it was a great time, man. And so that, there's my bear story yeah. since you asked. Sorry, that was That's a long awesome. story. No, that was fantastic. I loved it. I, I hadn't heard, um, you know, the part about the moose. I didn't realize he had a moose yeah. encounter included in that as well as the salmon wild. running. I um, So how, how old were you when you experienced that? Man, I was... Um, I was 17. 17. I was 17. Yeah, yeah it was That's wild. That's incredible. Man. Mm -hmm. I mean, so you, you know, as a 17 year old have done stuff that, you know, probably a lot of people would just dream about, mm -hmm. um, but would be too scared to do. So, you know, I, I think some of the, the audience is likely getting a sense of some of the uh, adventures that you kind of partake in. Um, I, I do have a question. I don't know if it'll go anywhere, but when you're out and doing these <coughs> adventures, these excursions, these experiences, you know, when you face that moose, when you face that bear, I can only imagine the feeling of fear and terror that that brings up. Were those experiences truly like fearful or terrifying or like, how do you sit with that fear? Like, I think a lot of people would think about facing a grizzly or a moose and the feeling of fear would be too much and people wouldn't even want to, to encounter that. Is is facing fearful things something that you've enjoyed doing your whole life, or are you a thrill seeker? Can you describe that a little bit? Yeah, man. Um, you know, as far as animals go, I haven't had a lot of opportunities to. I did back in the day, but here recently to be behind the gun. I think mm. most of my opportunities have been behind a camera or something like that, and I get to watch the hunter. And um, I think with that in mind. I, I never really had fear until the moment it came out. You know what I mean? It was excitement mm -hmm. until yeah. you saw the animal. And it wasn't fear. It was, it was adrenaline, man. It was adrenaline. Mm -hmm. When you see that thing for real, not in a video camera, not in, on YouTube, but you see this animal breathing and barking mm -hmm. and its paws hitting the ground and you can feel it shake the ground underneath you. It's like, this is... This is a, an incredible beast that you cannot believe was created by nature. Mm -hmm. And um, I, if you look at that video, I can maybe send you a link to it because it's on YouTube from that, that hunt. Yeah. Uh, when he shoots the animal, the camera completely shakes and misses the, the shot because oh, I, was, I was so entranced by this beast. I totally forgot we were shooting it. You know what I mean? And so when he shot it, it surprised the heck out of me. And I, I missed I missed the that that point of of the film mm -hmm. um man when it comes to seeking out things i am deathly afraid of heights and i think i grew up rock climbing i grew up um uh doing things that uh uh were height driven you know and yeah. um i think because i was real young doing a lot of that out in the ozarks and i think having that as a foundation for how i adventure and and have that kind of type two kind of fun mm -hmm. um i find it to be very easy for me to be drawn to things that make me afraid yeah and i think climbing is a big one I, i'd love to climb el cap one day I, just because yeah. i'm terrified the idea of it makes my hands sweat but i want to get to a point where it doesn't anymore and through training i can be do something that very few are have the cojones to do or mm -hmm. want to do and, um, you know, I, I rafted the Colorado a couple times and, and, and I think through those experiences, same kind of thing, man, mm -hmm. did not like water and you have no choice, but to interact with the worst of what water has to offer with those class five rapids. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think I'm drawn to fear yeah. when it comes to things that I seek when it comes to adventure and things like that. That's, that's really cool. I, I knew you had a rock climbing past and that you've rock climbed. I don't know if I ever realized that you had a fear of heights. Oh, big and, time, man. Big time. And you're, you're still have kind of that, that fear of heights, even though you have had these experiences rock climbing. I think it's all about putting your mind in the right spot. So mm. I think for Hudson, for me, it's very easy to, uh, I, I have kind of a OCD kind of thought life where, if I have a thought that I don't like, I cannot stop myself, but just focus on it, you know? And mm -hmm. I think that comes out 
that's kind of the worst quality and sometimes the best quality in, inside of inside of HUD. It's the worst because if I'm on that rock and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. I'm going to fall. And that's all I can think about when I'm only five feet up. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so it's all about focus and getting your mind on the right things. And I think that's what I love about climbing because it is a frightening thing, but it's meditation. If you mm. allow yourself the discipline to uh, not focus on the things that are frightening, but focus on the path ahead, just climb to the next point, climb to the next point. And it's a beautiful meditation on life, really. And I, I, I find myself when I'm building these businesses that I am today, not focusing on really the chaos of the world that's all around me of, oh, I could worry yeah. about that, I could worry about that. No, do the next step. And uh, I think it's the same with with climbing, just conquering that. Not It's not conquering fear. It's it's letting go of fear and putting it over oh. here while you move forward. So, yeah, I, I love that. I, um, you know, I think I, I have a similar kind of attitude, although probably not quite to the extreme that you do. Um, but definitely am someone who likes to take challenges, you know, head on. And if there is, you know, a, a fear, if there is, you know, an insecurity, or some doubt is I really like to go head on into that yeah. and sit with it and try to resolve it um, and be courageous through that. But that's that's awesome, inspiring that you've been able to become such a good climber and adventurer even with those fears. So I think that's also a refreshing thing to hear is that you can be a rock climber and an adventurer. And it doesn't mean that you're fearless. It doesn't mean that you're like a superhuman, like you do have the same fears as everyone else and have learned to sit with those and face those and become better because of it. So that's, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, man. Um, you mentioned some of the, the businesses that, that you're running currently and, and we'll definitely get to that, but yeah. you know, as a curiosity, I kind of wanted to hear a little bit about how some of these origins took place. And so, you know, I know adventuring has been a big part of your life. You know, entrepreneurship has been a big part of your life. You know, when you were a kid, whether that was somewhere between the ages of five and 10 or an early teen, when did you first start having some transformative experiences as it relates to both either these adventures and, and facing your fears of heights and rock climbing or... Yeah entrepreneurship did did one of those come first and is there anything that stands out yeah man i'd love to go into that um i rarely talk about myself so much and so it's very um eye-opening i get to see my story more through conversations like this so mm -hmm. I, I definitely appreciate it man so i think they both kind of intertwine i'll start with uh i'll start with the adventuring and just that kind of lifestyle where i grew up uh my family was not and very wealthy and uh, we didn't have a lot, but I remembered we we grew up about a mile away from a local climbing gym that's no longer there called La Casa Poil, LC. Mm. And when I was 10 or 11, uh, I realized that there was a place for this. And I, man, I grew up like I love climbing trees. I would buy rope and just rappel off the craziest crap just because I could. I'd make rope swings that go 80 feet across a terrain that was uninhabitable. And I remember my father told me about this place and he took me there one day and I met the owner. His name is Richard Ruland. I'm not sure if he's still around, but he was a great poet and storyteller. And uh, over time, I built a relationship with him and I began that, that became my home away from home where I would grow up with these, uh, with adventurers like Richard, this old timer from Vietnam who used to be a professional caver and uh, climb the craziest mountains across North America. And, and uh, other people like James and Jesse, Jesse and James, two brothers that were a wild bunch. And, uh, and they became family and they were my, like my big brothers, fatherly figures. And we would climb together. We would go across Arkansas, North America together, places like Waco Tanks and 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 just share stories, live stories together. And 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 uh, man, I, I think that was very foundational for me mm -hmm. is um, being with people like that who 
were kind of unhinged in a lot of ways and money was not the desire living was was life and figuring out hey this is my passion i want to become the best at it and honestly a lot of them were bums a lot of them were just like literally were train hopper hobos in a past life and found some quality in climbing that that it became a big piece of who they were mm -hmm. and um I, I, I was really inspired by a lot of their stories and a lot of uh, who they were. And uh, I think that's where I, I learned what camaraderie was. And I think that's where I learned uh, how to share a story was mm -hmm. those people. And um, I, I, uh, I think that's where my adventurous roots kind of began. And I'm still very close to a lot of those people. So that, that shares a very special place in my heart. Man, in regards to entrepreneurship, on a similar vein, my um, so my great grandfather started an organization called Christian Motorcycle Association, where they would, uh, uh, they would uh, uh, motorcycle across the nation and evangelize in jails and just the craziest thing ever. You know what I mean? Just like <laughs> Christian motorcyclist gangs going to jails and telling the gospel. And, um, so that's kind of where my roots are, where, mm -hmm. um, it's called CMA. They're still around. My family's no longer a part. And, uh, my grandfather, my biological grandfather, he was the head of that organization. And it was very big at that time. Like it, it, uh, the church that was the core of it was like half a city and the organization was across the nation and they would have these ginormous rallies. But, uh, my grandfather, he, he uh, he uh, cheated on my grandmother uh, around the time that I was born. And man, that split the family in two. One family that kind of followed the biological grandfather and one family that kind of followed my, my grandmother. And uh, the people that followed my grandmother uh, had a spirit about them that was like a chase for purity inside of their lives, but also just wildly entrepreneurial. I like Clay Newcomb. He founded Bear Hunting Magazine is now inside of Meat Eater or Misty Newcomb, his wife, who owns and runs a private school that's now global called Prism Education Center. Or my father, who wrote so many books and is a, has a doctorate in Middle Eastern studies and has his own podcast as well, mm -hmm. to my grandmother, who also wrote tons of books and just that spirit is on them for sure of entrepreneurial endeavors. And that's, that's the line I come from, not CMA, but these lines that had said, we don't want that in our lives. We're going to cut that off right here. This is not who we are. We're going to move over here to Northwest Arkansas. And they had nothing like they cut themselves off from the, the, the roots that they came from the money that they came from and started with nothing in the pursuit of, of, uh, of just a, having pure lives and, and, and living lives that are very like, mm -hmm. what does God want for us? Yeah. And, uh, that's the line that I come from and I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of the family line that I come from one being very adventurous bums who smoke a lot of pot, but love living life. And my real family, the family that I consider my own and I'm still, they are core to my life. Uh, the ones that chase after God, the ones that don't give a rat's batusk for what anybody else thinks and build a life that they boldly want to build. And so um, that's very brief, but that, I think that's those are the two lines that kind of yeah. coincide to make Hudson Hudson. I, I love that. There There's so many, I think, golden nuggets kind of sprinkled throughout that that origin story. And it's really cool that you get to have a family that is so inspired and driven to kind of pay, pay their own way mm -hmm. um, and pursue the things you want to pursue. And hearing that, it, it's almost like, um, you know, a story of the American dream. And, mm -hmm. you know, perhaps even that that's probably how a lot of immigrants likely feel of just yeah. going somewhere new, leaving everything they have behind and trying to build the life that they want to build. Yeah. Um, so that's really awesome and that you have that inspiration as well as the other side of, 
of having these these um, you know out of family bonds with these people that you were climbing with. Um, and one thing that is awesome is, and I want to kind of ask about is, um, were your parents really flexible? So I, I yeah. you, know, you were 10, 13, like lower teens in age and had the ability to travel across the country with some pot smoking bums. It sounds <laughs> like is, is that something that came out of a, a place of rebellion for you? And you're like, I'm going to do this whether you want me to or not, or did your, your family give you that flexibility, that freedom to start crafting your own path at an early age? Yeah. Yeah, man, man, in full transparency, I probably didn't travel the entire country with those bums without my, <laughs> I think that, um, the places I did go, my father was definitely around when I was out of country, gotcha. uh, but in state, yeah, we, we traveled around, man. Um, man, I think my father was pretty instrumental in that. And he, my mom, you know, she's a mom. She, she loved me and, and wanted to keep me close and was afraid of these, you know, influences and, and other things. And my dad was very much the opposite. Like he trusted me. He said, Hey, mm-hmm. Hudson, he has good character. He knows how to hold himself. And honestly, it'll probably ruin him if we keep him locked up, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, let him go do his thing. And my dad was, has always been on that vein of like, go travel, dude, go travel the world. I remember before I found my married, my wife, he, I, uh, I was, it was after a relationship and I was down a little depressed, wasn't enjoying work and just didn't really know where I was going. And he was very much like, dude, go to Antarctica if that's where you need to go. Like, live with the penguins. Do whatever you need to do <laughs> to find God, but to find yourself, you know, ultimately. And um, so I think my dad was, uh, thankfully, uh, had a posture of Hudson needs this in order to to uh, to be who he's called to be, you know. Mm-hmm. And um I think I, you know, I look at that. I think that's hard to do as a parent. You know, that's I, I'm not a parent yet, but I'm uh, eventually would like to have kids. And I, I honestly, I, it'd be hard for me to imagine giving that yeah. kind of freedom to a child unless I was very confident that's what they needed. And uh, my hope is to do something similar with my boys. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and and that's just a, a little thing that I feel like picked out of your story is that that trust. And, and freedom that it seems like your parents gave you. Yeah. And I, I, I agree completely. I, I want to be the type of parent that has that, that trust in their kids. Um, and, and is the type of parent that allows my children to explore their own paths. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't want to tell them this is how you have to live, but give yeah. them the tools to live and let them you know, go and, and create their own way. But yeah. yeah, the idea of doing that, I feel like is just so difficult to mm-hmm. actually let go of the reins and let your children make mistakes and travel mm-hmm. and get into situations that, you know, as a parent, you would think are not safe or, or smart at all. Yeah. But that's really cool. So I mean, uh, it, awesome family values that seems like you picked up and, and entrepreneur spirit and the ability to take risks and and go out there so yeah that's really cool um you know i you mentioned this this entrepreneur journey so you got the spirit from your family and it's kind of engraved in in your bloodline and it's part of who your family is when did you begin on that entrepreneur journey yourself so it sounded like the adventures and that exploration came maybe a little bit before entrepreneurship did, but what were some of those early experiences with entrepreneurship? And and when did you kind of figure out that, Hey, I can take this exploration, this adventure, this ability to, to seek new things and kind of apply this to the real world in the form of a business. Mm, Yeah, man, man. I mean, I, I think like most kiddos, I mowed lawns, things like that. My dad was definitely very helpful with that as well. But I think the thing that really kicked off just the entrepreneurial bug and kind of changed my life was a, a company I founded called Screaming Bull. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, it was a skin salve, like skin repair. That's what we endorsed, that we could heal cut scrapes and callus. We could heal cut scrapes and blisters, but we could keep the calluses. That's That was wow. our advertisement with the salve that I made. And um, yeah, we had a beautiful logo. It was basically, man, over so many times of experimenting, we fin- I finally found a product that worked and it was motivated by climbers not having a product to put on their cuts and scrapes um, to heal them quickly. You know, so if you got a flapper and tore open your skin while you're climbing, uh, you're, you're kind of screwed. Just tape it up and it's going to hurt a lot, but it's probably going to hurt for another week or two before it actually heals. And the idea was creating a product that could fix that, make it not a week, but a day or two where it, it officially heals, you know, and we created it. I, I, I keep saying we, I created it. And, uh, man, we sold that at CrossFit jams, climbing jams. I had a little cigar box and I had a little, uh, a branded display on the top of the cigar box with all the tins on the interior and, uh, some instructions mm-hmm. in regards to, to how to use it. And then a little kind of like dog, paper dog tag that would come out of the tin can with a stamped little ingredients list and, uh, a message on the back from me personally. And, uh, we sold them at Fayette show. Like we sold them everywhere, man. It was, it was a really cool, it was, it, 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 uh, accelerated a lot quicker than I was anticipating. And I went to a lot of elevator pitches for entrepreneurs, like with startup junkie here locally. Yeah. And, uh, I pitched screaming bull and we won money. It was like, Oh my gosh, this is awesome. <laughs> and it, it took over my life and in a lot of ways where I would skip high school. This was my saw senior year and uh, I would skip school and uh, I'd near about flunked my senior year. And I, I, literally like a percentage point away from uh, not passing my senior year and not being able to graduate. Wow. Um, because I was so devoted to this business and uh, uh, it, it went really well. And, and then I got to college and, uh, my freshman year I was in business management and I just realized, you know what? I really have two choices here. I can either do screaming bull or, and drop out of college, or I can drop screaming bull and continue with college. It really paved the way for a lot of my, uh, uh, um, like it, it paid for a lot of my bills and whatnot. So screaming bull was very helpful. And, uh, like it paid for about half my schooling, which was wonderful. Wow. And, uh, I dropped screaming bull because I felt like college is the route I needed to go. Um, I think that was a poor choice cause I got two years in and dude, I was not doing well. I hated school. I felt like a, mm. a, a jail. Like it was not fun for HUD. And, uh, I got two years in and I, I dropped out. It just wasn't for me. <laughs> and mm-hmm. that's uh, around my freshman year of college is when I started with field agent and ultimately got a full-time gig pretty soon there. So I felt I just college wasn't for me, but I'm making good yeah. money. Let's just continue on with field agent. So yeah. that's, I think Screaming Bull is really what started the entrepreneurial bug. That's awesome. And uh, I'll have a few questions about kind of the origin of Screaming Bull um, but I, I do think it is, you know, inspiring and helpful for other people to hear that, you know, college, while it is a, a path lots of people can take, and it's going to be helpful for a lot of people, it absolutely isn't necessary and yeah. nor the only way you can get an education. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I'm sure the lessons you've learned from Screaming Bull to the lessons you learn from, you know, the full-time job that you had at field agent Mm -hmm. and actually getting to experience the world and business are likely much more instrumental than the lessons you learn from reading a textbook. Yeah. You know, you can have all the theories and, and, you know, the high level overviews of how this stuff fits together, but until you see it and can kind of click the pieces of a business and life together yourself, you know, the, the college is just kind of a waiting period. So yeah. I think that's a definitely a, something inspirational to people out there who are considering whether they want to go to college or not. You know, it can 
be helpful, but it absolutely mm-hmm. isn't the only way. A hundred percent, man. Yeah. You know, it, it, college is very much, uh, if you want to get a corporate job right now, I could see this changing in the future, but if you wanted to get a corporate job now, it truly is a golden ticket. There is something very mm-hmm. special about having a college degree. If corporate is where you want to be and that's completely fine. And, uh, if that's what you want and there's something very nice about having a reoccurring paycheck that you can budget off of, it makes financing things a whole lot easier. Um, there's something very good about having a corporate kind of role. Um, Mm -hmm. So yeah, if you're a business guy or gal and are in school, there's nothing wrong with that if corporate's where you want to go. But I think you can learn a lot from actual experience out in the field with owning your own business or being part of a startup. So Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I I did want to kind of ask Poke a little bit at the origin of Screaming Bull again. Um, so, you know, you were, you were a climber in your, your teens. Um, and so you had, you know, theoretically some of this experience climbing when you decided to look into SAVs, you know, one kind of how old were you when you started down this, this path of, of screaming bull and, you know, what was the order of kind of operations there? Did you, you know, one day were you climbing and have a cut and we're like, oh, I need to do something about this? Did you say, hey, I've got an awesome logo and like brand mm-hmm. name called Screaming Bull and I need to put a product to it? You yeah. know, how old were you and what was that that first thing that happened that gave you the idea that maybe there's something here? Yeah. Great question, man. I, I think, man, I couldn't tell you the origin. Um, I'm sure, man, I, I really don't know. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think I found some, some, uh, like, uh, easy Etsy kind of salve ingredients mm-hmm. list. But, huh. If it's that easy to make, maybe we could make one targeted to climbers in particular. Mm-hmm. And I was maybe 16 or 17 when that happened. And Man, I started experimenting, and I I eventually found one that that worked, that made sense for it. It, it dried for one; it wasn't just this oily yeah. product, and uh, but it was perfect. It was it had a nice smell. It healed the skin, and uh, I started with little tents, and I'd sell it. I had a cardboard box just filled with tents, and. <laughs> Dude, I'm a salesman at heart, and I would just go at my high school with this cardboard box, and I would just tell everybody about this this epic product, man. <laughs> and uh, I had like half the football team on Screaming Bull. I had a bunch of gymnasts doing it, and I just had this cardboard box. And over time, it was a little frightening because I'd have wads of cash in this cardboard box <laughs> as well as salves. And so I had to find a different system. And I eventually said, you know what? This product is working for people. Let's mm-hmm. Let's start let's start actually making a product. And so I, I, I think what I learned was the, the absolute importance of connecting with people who had skills that you didn't. So I connected with this woman named Min Cow who was at the high school and she created a graphic design for us for the screaming bull kind of logo. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I, uh, I connected with other people in regards to different, who had different connections with the community. And over time, we I went to a startup competition, raised some money, won that startup event, and used that money to uh, kind of have a bulk sale of the product and had some mm-hmm. displays and things like that. And I started going, just emailing a ton of businesses. Fate Show was actually our first ever client, believe it or not. Really? And uh, yeah, we were able to get in the Fate Show store. And dude, we were we had some. It was weird because we would sell our tins there for $12 a tin. Other places we would sell them for eight. We always sold out at Fayette Shell sooner than we sold out anywhere else. And uh, um, we sold at Pack Rat. We sold all over the place. And I think what I learned from that experience with Screaming Bull was two things. Number one, don't do everything alone. Find people around you who have skills that could help this business and lean on them to help you. Uh, that's something I I overstrained myself so much, trying to do the branding, trying to build the website, trying mm-hmm. to uh, 
do it all. And it was unnecessary and truly what caused the stress that made me quit. Yeah. And number two, uh, stick to an idea because Screaming Bull, I got so excited about it. It became something we, so I'm not sure if you've seen our shirts. I need to get you a shirt. We still have so many. Um, oh, I, haven't started, seen, I haven't seen yeah, the shirts. We have a Screaming Bull shirt and we thought, you know what, we could be a lifestyle company. You know, we don't have to just sell salve. We could sell clothing too. And so we wasted so much money and made no profit off these really comfortable, um, like they're called a Heather blend. So they got, or a tri blend, they have polyester cotton and polyethylene or something. And, uh, it's just a really nice shirt. And, uh, we started selling those instead of the salve. And we said, when you buy a shirt, you buy adventure. So anybody who bought one of the shirts, we would literally have adventures every three months where we take, took everybody out where we bought the food. Uh, we, uh, helped and managed all the transportation and we take them somewhere epic and we went to Kyle's landing and we did awesome stuff with these groups of strangers that bought the clothing and uh, but we just made no money off of it and it was a lot of stress and although that was fun it was not the, the it was not the the reason for screaming bull mm -hmm. and that's where we started going south uh, stick with stick with a plan and communicate that wholeheartedly with a group of people you trust and don't move out of that plan until you reach goals that you've set. So mm. that's, yeah, it was a good experience, man. Yeah, you, you put your hand in a few too many cookie jars, right? Amen, brother. But that that's still really cool. I mean, great lessons yeah. to be learned there. I, I didn't realize that um, what I, I knew about the salve and mm -hmm. that you were able to sell that. Uh, I didn't know that the the shirts and the, the lifestyle adventures was, yeah. was something you would do. Yeah, I, um, and the, the funny thing is too, is for screaming bull as the company, it was, you had this, this really great product that mm -hmm. you had been able to sell to individuals, but start to sell to, to stores and things like that, which is a great business and a product and idea in itself. And that was working and, and could have grown from there. The, the other interesting thing is then you've got this lifestyle business idea, which is the shirt and the adventures and kind of that whole thing. And that on its own is probably a great business idea that you can mm -hmm. focus on and probably could have built out to be something. But mm -hmm. it is one of those interesting things about business that if you try to put both of these two things together, all of a sudden the resources, the time, the attention is split and you can exactly. now do neither one of those as good as it needs to be to succeed. Yeah. And so, yeah, that lesson about focusing on what is super important is, is a great lesson to learn. And I'm sure if you wanted to start from scratch, you could likely go back and make a shirt in an adventure company that sells merchandise and takes people on experience. <laughs> And if you go into it with that as the core focus, I'm yeah. I'm sure it's something that you could pull off and make happen. Yeah, don't tempt me, Ryan. Don't tempt me, man. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Hey, well, um, as a as a little side story uh, from my perspective, I'll, I'll I'll tell a little bit about an adventure Hudson has uh, has taken me and my girlfriend Emily on, um, and that was out near Kyle's Landing, where where we went to these falls. Oh, what, yeah. what were the what were the falls called? Um, Indian Creek is where we went. Um, yeah. I, I don't think, dude, I think we're the first people ever to be on those falls. That's that's my, that's what I'm going to tell people. It was incredible. So mm -hmm. we went um, kind of out of nowhere. You know, if uh, H Hudson's a, a, a great adventurer, um, me and my girlfriend, you know, we're uh, we're pretty comfortable behind our little computer screens here. Now we've we've got some adventurous bones in our bodies too, but it takes a little coaxing to get these bears out of their cave. Um, but <laughs> Hudson, uh, you know, a few years back it was a, a beautiful um, summer, late summer morning, I believe, or early spring, something like that. Um, a beautiful day. And we decided, Hey, we're going to, we're going to drive an hour or two to, um, what was it? Ponca, Ponca, Arkansas. Yeah. Around Jasper, that area. Yeah. Yeah. Jasper Ponca. And there's some beautiful areas. There's, uh, I think the Buffalo river, 
uh, is, is flowing through there. Um, and just a, a gorgeous area. Hawksbill Craig is, uh, is there. So if, if you're on the internet listening, uh, you can look up Hawksbill Craig. It's a it really beautiful area in Arkansas. Mm-hmm. And we went to Indian Creek and, and, uh, Emily, uh, my girlfriend is, has never been much of an adventurer. She, she's got an adventurous bone in her body, but, um, hasn't done quite the crazy stuff that Hudson does. And, and to extent me, uh, but I'm not a crazy adventurer as well. And Hudson was telling us, Hey, we've got this beautiful hike. We're going to hike through, you know, a Creek bed. It's going to come up to some waterfalls. It's going to be amazing. And so, yeah. uh, we decided, Hey, we're going to go. We drove out really early in the morning and started hiking. Well, first we, we parked and it's the type of area that there's no cell service. So you lose cell service 30, 45 minutes before you even make it to the parking lot and you pull into the, the quote parking lot. And it is just, it's just a spot of gravel in the middle of the woods that you have to go through some treacherous roads to even make it down there. And then we're like, okay, let's, let's start this hike. We're hiking through the woods and just spider webs and spiders. We're batting them all down and uh, we make it to this Creek and that's Indian Creek. And uh, uh, apparently I, I don't know if I knew this at the time, but is one of, if not the most dangerous, dangerous trail in this part of Arkansas with the most helicopter evacuations <laughs> than any other trail I and, might have not have told them that detail before they started the trip. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so we were, at least we were geared up. We were happy, we were ready to go. We had our peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And we start, luckily, the, the creek was dried up. And so we're navigating through this creek, and it is slippery and rocky and treacherous. And we're climbing over boulders. And we finally get to the very end of this trail, and it is just a marvel to behold. For hundreds of feet on either side, you're down in this this ravine, this cavern, um, and you can climb up these ropes to get to the top and view out. But Hudson and myself, and uh, then my girlfriend Emily followed behind, we decided the, the river was pretty dry and the waterfalls weren't pouring. So we decided, Hey, we're going to, let's try to climb up these waterfalls. And we ended up free soloing up these series of waterfalls. And it had to be, I don't know, Hudson, what, what's the feet or yardage? How did climbers yeah. measure their climbs in a situation <laughs> like this? Yeah, that was probably 50 or 60 feet. We were, we were, we were up there, man. We were up yeah. there for sure. We were up there and hey, ended Ryan up. Ryan free soloed near about 80 feet. That was incredible. He did awesome. Yeah. And, and the, the funny thing is, is me and Hudson just started, you know, we got to this, it was kind of the end of the trail. Um, we sat down, ate some sandwiches and, and um, we were with Emily and, and our friend Kate. And so they sat down and we were just, you know, taking a break and Hudson and I just, you know, started kind of small at first. We were like, Hey, let's just climb over this first little waterfall. And above a waterfall, there was this, this landing that was like a little pond. And it was almost like an oasis that yeah. we were just surprised by. And uh, Emily, then a few minutes later, started, started coming up that way too. And it was already pretty treacherous. And uh, Hudson and I started climbing up the next series of waterfalls and just hear some hollering back down. And I panicked i thought Mm -hmm. emily just fell off a waterfall all i hear is screaming for help and so i hustled down this waterfall and emily had gotten stuck in this not in a rock but kind of she passed this landing that was slippery and felt like she couldn't go back down and now was in this position where the only way out was up and yeah. and it was a 60 foot climb up some waterfalls in a, a a way a place that we don't think anyone else has ever been to or climbed before and so we ended up climbing hudson luckily had some climb experience and showed us the path and at the very very top of these waterfalls like you said 60 80 feet up um you climb through a tiny little crack 
in the rock and just we were there uh, almost panicked but it you know like you were mentioning about fear earlier is you have this fear but you don't have the option to yeah. let the fear take control mm -hmm. um the only option is facing that fear, sitting with that fear, discarding it and doing what has to be done. And, yeah. and we did that and, and conquered those waterfalls. It was, it was incredible, an incredible experience. Mm -hmm. Ryan killed it, y'all. He did amazing. I've never seen if a guy who has never done that kind of stuff before, just take it on, man. And we got to the top and I was, there's something about those kind of experiences where you're facing death that really brings two people together. And I <laughs> really saw Ryan as a brother after that experience. Yeah, he became Burley Brooks after that rendezvous. Origin story. Yeah. 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 So, well, awesome. So we, we talked some about adventuring, some about the start of screaming bull and, um, yeah. you know, what that led to. Um, an awesome entrepreneurial journey and start. Um, wanted to transition a little bit to the next stages of your entrepreneurial journey. And so, sure, excuse me. Um, so after Screaming Bull, you ended up kind of taking a hiatus from that. You ended up working at Field Agent, your full time job, and that's where we got to know each other. Mm -hmm. Um, what were the next kind of steps for entrepreneurship it was yeah, there man. just a pause a recollection were there ideas you know what what did that next step of your journey look like sure man you know and i i it's so interesting because i've never had the opportunity to kind of go through this chronologically because when i look at my time at field agent it was like a hiatus man it was like a hiatus of like deep interpersonal building inside of Hudson's core of who he is and what what really defines him. Because I think before Field Agent, Hudson was kind of not a loose cannon, but just friggin' wild. And no, 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 he just had no ability to, to build. It was more of like, let's just go, man, and just mm. let the wind take us. And to to be the man that I wanted to be, I couldn't, I couldn't be just that, you know what I mean? And, um, I don't know if that makes sense, but when I started field agent, a lot of things happened in my personal life as well. Uh, I had a relationship with a girl that didn't work out and it, it was some deep rejection that brought me to a very, I mean, I was depressed. Like uh, there's no if, ands or buts about it. And I started going to, to therapy and, um, uh, that showed me a lot of things inside of myself that I didn't realize I still held on to from when I was a child, things I mm. didn't know I had against my father, things I didn't know I, I needed to forgive people for about the hurt and rejection. Yeah. And uh, during that time of deep personal building, I was starting my career at field agent as well. And I worked for as a part timer and I worked my way into an internship which eventually led to a full-time job in lead development and then to sales. And eventually I spent a year in, I guess what we'd call strategy with Ryan. And uh, do we work on any other team besides that client experience? I feel like we were always next to each other or near. We, we were, uh, we were always kind of friends from a distance. Yeah. But I don't know if we ever really worked on the same teams. It feels like I actually followed you from <laughs> the team you're leaving, taking That's your spot. Funny. So even though Hudson's a couple of years younger than me, he, uh, he was the one paving the path for me through field agent. I was just, uh, I was grabbing onto a shirt tail and letting him yeah, kind of lead man. the way. If you guys don't know this about Ryan, the way he thinks is incredible. I don't mean to toot his horn, but he's a he truly can craft and have ideas that are Steve Jobs level ideas. He's I, I, I'll always be near Ryan so I can steal one of his <laughs> ideas one day. I'm just kidding. Um, man, no. So Fuel Agent developed me and taught me how to be a professional in a lot of ways. I mm. learned to slick my hair back, how to wear a suit. And, uh, I, uh, just learned how to talk to clients and understood clients needs a lot better, how to form an email, basic things like that, that I didn't really have the fundamentals for before field agent. So I really do see field agent, although I didn't go to college, field agent was my education for the, my professional life moving forward. Mm -hmm. 
And Henry, this one of the founders of Field Agent, he always has called that company kind of like a greenhouse and a place that people can learn to be, where they can grow into who they're supposed to be. And he's also called it a launch pad where, hey, grow here. But if you feel called to launch somewhere else, use this as a launching pad. And so that really in, in its truest form is what field agent was for me. And, mm-hmm. you know, I was there for six years and uh, it was a great run. Wow. But uh, there was a, 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 a layoff at field agent, to say it bluntly. And uh, um, Hudson was a part of that layoff and wasn't necessarily performance related, but I knew it was my time to go. You know what I mean? I, I remember about a year ago. So I got laid off from field agent about two weeks ago. And a year ago, I had started a business called Shreve Cleaning. Oh, dude, your Chihuahua. He's, he's hanging out. Oh, yeah. Um, he's, he's been here. Yeah. Uh, about a year ago, before I left field agent, I started a business called Shreve Cleaning. And truly, the only reason I started this cleaning business is because it had little overhead. And uh, I can make lots of money doing it, supposedly. And... Um, I did that for about a year as I was working at field agent and it was exhausting, man. I was working night and day doing cleans, hiring people. And I learned a lot from that experience as well, Mm -hmm. but, um, really built, I have built Shreve cleaning to a place where it's nearing a place where I can lean on it wholeheartedly. And, uh, and it might not, it's definitely not the end goal, but because I have left field agent and moved on, uh, it's, kind of become core to Hudson's mm-hmm. entrepreneurship and what he's doing now. And we're focusing a lot on true cleaning. And I think the biggest thing we're focusing on now is one marketing. We know how to market our products and our yeah. services, and uh, we know how to make money doing it. And two, finding the right people to run the teams. Those are the two things we're looking at right now. And so we've been running true cleaning for about a year. I have, I started it and have a lot of people that help and I've taken learnings from screaming bull. And I've mm-hmm. taken learnings from field agent and I've taken learnings from the past year at Shreve cleaning to really build it to where it is now. And, um, man, I'm, I'm incredibly excited for its future. Somehow I have more joy and excitement, uh, cleaning toilets than I do working in the corporate world. I, uh, I truly love that entrepreneurial way of life and, uh, I'm really excited for its future. I think what we, we will eventually take Shreve cleaning to, uh, shreve properties and do a lot of property management Mm -hmm. uh with short-term rentals like airbnbs and things like that the two businesses just work really well together and uh eventually who knows what the future holds i'd like to get back in the more the adventure lifestyle space that's kind of where my heart resides and where i find a lot of joy and so i don't know when and how we'll get there but all i know is, is right now this feels right and i'm yeah i'm I'm learning from my failures in the past of not working with people to work with people now and get different people's fingerprints on it. And, uh, I think this, this makes sense for the time being. And, uh, I am so very thrilled to start this business with my wife. And I'm very thrilled to be a full-time entrepreneur. Like this, this is my life from now on. And yeah, I, I remember my dad telling me when I was presenting my family, the website for Shreve cleaning, and this was about a year ago, he, uh, I had been working for field agent for about five years at that point. And he looked at me after I was done presenting and he said, Hudson, I, I haven't seen you this with this much joy or excitement about something in, in five years. And that's when I realized, oh my gosh, although field agent was wonderful, it did kind of numb me to Mm. a lot of who I was as a man, a lot of the characteristics that, that gave me so much joy in life, the adventure, the excitement for living, the uh, thrill of just eating what you kill. And um, I'm very excited to get back in that mode and uh, not only find adventure out in nature, and uh, out in the woods, which I had some doing a lot more of finding uh, adventure and entrepreneurship and starting a, a family <clears throat> adventure. Yeah. I truly feel as though entrepreneurship is the last remnant of the wild west where mm-hmm. you can do anything you want, but whatever you do, there is 
major consequences if you do it wrong. <laughs> and it truly is the Wild West, man. And uh, I recommend everybody, if you have any desire to be your own boss, go for it. Just stop saying you're going to do it tomorrow. I unfortunately did that. I did that for too long. And I had to be laid off. And honestly, unless I was laid off, I might have never have left field agent. So I'm very excited. I was smiling and laughing a little bit in the when they did lay me off, just because I knew this was right. This is where Hudson needs to be. Yeah. And uh, man, that was jumbled. It wasn't really chronological. But man, I am excited for this next season. We we have Shreve cleaning. Eventually, we'll have Shreve properties, and eventually, we'll um, hopefully get into the product space because that's really where my passions are. And I'm not sure yes. what that product will be, but we shall see. I I love that. Thanks for uh, sharing. And I definitely have some follow up questions. Um, sure for Shreve Cleaning and, and kind of this stage of your journey, I just want to pause for a moment and just sit with the image of, and you know, hopefully this is, this is okay to share, but sit with the image of you sitting in a room, getting laid off with a smile on your face <laughs> and just <laughs> hearing this news and just being almost joyful about the opportunity yeah. to go and pursue your own thing. So yeah. I love man it it yeah exactly it was it was wild because i there is something about who i am called to be as a man that is not mm-hmm. i i man i i am a very faith-based man that's who i am and mm-hmm. there was something about my time in the corporate world that i felt i lost touch with my god in a lot of ways where i became yeah more dependent upon this job as honestly an idol. Like I have to have this. I Mm -hmm. serve this job in a lot of ways versus like, God, where, where am I supposed to go? And kind of just living wherever he tells me to and serving that a lot more than, than a job. And I don't know if that makes sense, but for me and who I am, it was, it was beautiful to, to be laid off and now, okay, here we go. Yeah, let's go. Let's go chase after this thing, and let's do it right this time. So yeah. it's exciting. Ne- necessity is is the greatest motivation, and mm-hmm. I know there will be some people that that relate to that. I definitely do. That's the type mm-hmm. of person that I am. Is just throw me in the water and tell me to swim. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it, you know, it was re- you're you're talking about that. It remind when you're you know cleaning toilets and stuff. It reminds me, you know, the entrepreneur spirit, it's the type of person that will work 80 hours as an entrepreneur to, so they refuse to work 40 hours for someone else. Um, Exactly. So I, I get that. I I did want to kind of rewind a little bit though. So, um, to kind of, once again, the, the origins of businesses are so fascinating to me Mm -hmm. and, you know, you mentioned you you were in field agent. You you had this job for six years. So you were probably four or five years in. Um, had a little bit of a hiatus from Screaming Bull. What do you remember the origin point, or or what kind of made you think that cleaning and setting up Shreve Cleaning could be the thing you could do? I, I know you you've done like photography, yeah. you've done these lifestyle businesses. You've created products. Do you remember how you kind of initially landed on cleaning while you were in field agent? Man, I remember watching a video on YouTube because at this point I was getting pretty numb to field agent. And I just, mm-hmm. I, I, I remember nothing wrong with field agent, but for who I was, it was, um, I just felt dead inside, man. I did not, mm-hmm. I did not feel good coming into the office and there's something wrong. And I remembered screaming bull and I remembered I have that entrepreneurial bug why am I not feeling it? And I remember watching videos on YouTube and I saw this one video about this guy who in Toronto, and we, we really do base a lot of our model around his model. Uh Um, but who built a, he got laid off and he built a cleaning empire in Toronto where dude in the first year they brought in 70 K and then next year they brought in 300 and wow. Holy crap. And they asked him how he's why he started it. He said there's little overhead, and I needed a job, so I just started cleaning houses. And um, I thought, you know what? Let's just try it. Let's give it a year. Let's give it a go. And 
if it's not for us, we'll get out of it. But mm -hmm. I remember building that business plan and just realizing what, what I love about entrepreneurship is not always the product. It's the process. It's, um, can I build something? It's like, you have an idea, man. Yeah. And can I make this dream a reality? And it's like magic because you do it. Like if you put your mind to it, you can create something that, that no one else had except you and bring it into reality. Mm -hmm. And we created something like our website's beautiful. I knew that in this space in Northwest Arkansas, if we could have a good e-commerce, we would be able to uh, create something that is competitive, if not better than any other cleaning business in the area. And I can proudly say we have the best reviews in Northwest Arkansas now because of that model. And um, man, a year went by and Hudson got laid off around that year mark where I said, okay, let's, let's evaluate if true clean is something we want to continue with. Yeah. And um, it's, it's just, it's like, man, I have always started businesses and they lasted a year and then I gave up. Let's not give up. And I remember my dad, like, I, and all these stories, he keeps coming up and he really was influential. I remember talking to him about it and he said, uh, man, I mean, the first year is always the hardest. It's going to get better. And I remember him telling me that when I first started Shreve Clean, it's like, it's gonna be rough this first year. And I remember that being very pivotal inside of how I viewed it's like, screw giving this up. Cleaning, I don't necessarily enjoy, but we have an incredible model and it's my business. Let's learn and let's continue. So I, uh, I'm i very excited to continue, man. And we are we don't have any ads running, but we get calls all the time. I just got done with them. We're still learning all the time too. I just got done with a 20-hour clean. It, it took us 20 hours and two days to do a, this giant warehouse clean in, uh, in Bentonville. And we didn't make as much as we could have. We didn't, honestly, there's some areas where we could have done better. But it was such a good learning experience and it's such a good story to have. And it's a great connection in the community itself. So, man, yeah, that's kind of our origin and that's why we're going still. Yeah. And uh, we shall see what the future holds. But uh, as of right now, I, I'm, I'm confident that this is this is at the very least, let's find people to run it if we don't if we're not going to run this six months down the road because it should continue. I, I love that. And, and there's, there's kind of a message that I feel like I picked up on while you're, you're talking about Shreve cleaning and that is the process. And it sounds like the process of starting the business, mm -hmm. the process of thinking through what needs to be done to run it, the process of actually running it and then growing the business is, is what is lighting your fire. Yeah, And I think so many people approach op entrepreneurship and just imagine what is the end goal and the end goal mm -hmm. for some people could be, I, I want to have a lot of money or mm -hmm. I want to be my own boss. And, but I think one of the true beauties of entrepreneurship and what it sounds like you're finding and have found is that the process, the road the journey is as magical as the destination. 100% man. And it lives in that same area as a lot of my uh, adventures did in the past where I'd be climbing rocks. I had terrible fear of climbing those rocks and that's why I did it. Honestly, man, I am terrified of, of being my own boss or having a wife and me not being able to provide, uh, to live in a position where it's like, I don't have a recurring check. Holy moly. What are we going to do? But that gives me even more drive to do it, man. It's that mm -hmm. fear that it, if you don't let it define your actions, but if you don't let it, well, fear should not motivate you to stop what you're doing. Fear should be the thing that motivates you to continue. It's like, I will not let this fear drive me. And it's that same thing as from when I was a child. It's like, I'm going to climb this rock and I'm not going to focus on that fear. I'm just going to do it one step at a time. It's the same with entrepreneurship. Don't be afraid. One step at a time. Just continue down the path. And um, yeah, man, it's it's wonderful. It truly is what I was a big piece of my calling. I'm I'm finding through cleaning toilets. <laughs> <laughs> that that is amazing. It, it it reminds me of this phrase I heard, um, and I can't remember where it's from, but 
the phrase goes something like, I don't know where I'm going, but I know exactly how to get there. Yeah. And it's that idea of just one step at a time, yeah. one foot in front of the other, enjoy the journey, enjoy the yeah. process, face the challenge, face your fear. Mm -hmm. And that's how you learn and that's mm -hmm. how you grow. And even if the business isn't a resounding success, even if it isn't mm -hmm. a grand slam, you are left in a place where you're more knowledgeable and yeah. have more information and are better skilled and better suited to do the next thing. So mm -hmm. even in a quote failure, you're positioning yourself for future success. Mm -hmm. oh, I 100%. That. I love it. You know, I tell my wife all the time where we're at right now, it's intense, it's chaotic. Uh, it hurts sometimes, but we will look back on this five years from now with a smile knowing, yeah. oh, wow, that is a good story right there. I think there's two types of fun. There's two types of stories and there's only one that's a real good story. There's the type of fun that it's like a roller coaster where it's like when you're doing it, when you get off, it's like, oh, that that's real fun, you know, and but you don't really remember it, you know, mm -hmm. and it's not ten, five years from now. It won't be looked at as fun. It won't be a good story. You just rode a roller coaster. Yeah. But then there's those moments that suck and you're in the muck of it and it's not fun. But five years from now, those are the moments that you're going to look back on and say, oh, that was fun. That's a good <laughs> story. You know, I'll have that for. I'm going to share that with my kids. You're not going to share the roller coaster story. You're going to share the story of you in the muck and, yeah. but continuing on doing something that everybody else said, I can't do and doing it. You know, mm -hmm. those are the stories that you'll remember and that make you who you are, you know? And so I definitely hear, hear that based off that quote you said. Yeah. Love that. Well, you know, Hudson, we're, we're past it an hour and 10 minutes. This has been a great conversation. Um, but I think, I, I'm feeling fired up. I'm ready to go do my thing. Always a pleasure speaking with you. You know, in the, the last couple minutes we have here, is is there anything that you want to, you know, leave with the audience or, or other questions that you want to ask me, for example, um, before kind of wrapping the, the conversation up? Man, what's, what's uh, with all about my life? How about you? What's uh, the podcasting, the businesses? I know you've had your hand in quite a few different cookie jars. Yes. Uh, what the Brooks, the Burley Brooks empire, where do you see it going? If I'm um, so, if, if you'd be willing to share over the next yeah. five years. That, that's a great question. And, you know, I think, I think similar to your story um, and your passion for, for following your journey, I, that's kind of where I sit with all this media, with the podcast, with with YouTube and things like that is I have found through media, through through having conversations on the podcast or by exploring ideas myself um, or through my YouTube and trying out different diets, trying out different adventures um, that I found these outlets that allow me to pursue what I'm passionate and interested in. Yeah. And so the dream, if I were to dream an end point or a goal is that I can craft my own life where the ideas that I have, the conversations that I have and share and the passions and interests that I pursue are, that is my life and that is my lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And I can create incomes from pursuing the things in life that give my life meaning. And yeah. so that's the goal. And I'm hoping that through media, I can, I can do that and achieve that. But also I'm really hoping to share these types of lessons with people and yeah. help provide ideas and inspirations and morals and an example of a path that people can live and just live it differently. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anyone necessarily will enjoy doing all the things that I do, but I want to live in a way that it is an example that there are different ways to live yeah. and that we can be good people and help others and help ourselves and just find ways to live a happy, healthy, and, and meaningful life. And my goal is that this media is just going to enable me to do that. And it already mm -hmm. has 
enabled me to really just dive in to my passions and interests. And no, I don't really get money from it. There's definitely not enough income um, right now to support me, but you know that's part of the journey. And yeah. I'm I'm really loving it. And maybe one day I'll I'll I'll, I'll follow in your footsteps and start a start a business myself. Um, yeah. And I can see that in my future. But yeah, right now this media just gives me an outlet to to think deeper about who I am and and yeah. share that with the world. I love that man. I was talking to Patrick the other day about you, Patrick Pulliam, and mm -hmm. he, uh, we were talking about how, I was talking about how like motivated I get by you and how you are not one to, you're, you're just open to anything, man. And it's, you're not driven by the dollar figure. You're not driven by, uh, what others will think of this. It's based solely upon your curiosity and your drive to uh, uncover more from that curiosity and fulfill yeah. that curiosity's need. Um, it's beautiful. You are a very passionate human. You got a lot to give to the world. So don't stop this, man. That's for sure. Man, do you know the, um, do you know If by Rudyard Kipling, the poem? No, I don't. No. Can I read it to the audience real quick? I think it'd be a good way. Less hoorah. Yes, please. Yeah. All right, man. So this is If by Rudyard Kipling. He's a poet and is written in 1895. And he is writing this to his son. That's kind of the point of view. And he's writing this to his son when his son's a child. Here it goes. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being lied about. Don't deal in lies or being hated. Don't give way to hating and yet don't look too good nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve or your turn long after you are gone, and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings, nor lose the common touch. If neither foes nor living, loving friends can hurt you. If all men count with you, but none too much. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 sec seconds, worth of distance run yours is the earth and everything that's in it and which is more you'll be a man my son i felt like that'd be a good kind of crescendo to our wow. conversation today uh, that is a fantastic poem I, i'm glad yeah. you shared that's called if by rudyard kipling if by rudyard Kip kipling well that is an amazing crescendo to amazing conversation Hudson, thank you so much for taking the time to hop on the the podcast with me. Um, for the listeners, thank you so much for listening. I hope you found this conversation as valuable and enjoyful that I did. I got a ton from it. I have a ton of notes. Um, to support Hudson, there's going to be some links in the description. We'll link to Shreve Cleaning. So if you're in the Northwest Arkansas area, <laughs> Uh, we'll, we'll have that link there and, and any other useful links to find, uh, Hudson. Uh, like we said, he's, he's been one of my good friends for a long time An inspiration to, to myself and, and hopefully now a handful of other people. Um, Hudson, any, any last words, man, not a one, just keep on keeping on everybody. Keep much on, love. Keep it really on. Looks. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, Hudson, I, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time. And in the words of Hudson, go out and face your fear. Stop saying you'll do it tomorrow and go do it.
Thank you for listening, everyone. Have a wonderful day.